I'm going to invite us into a breath or two just to center, to breathe in God's presence and peace. So raise your hands if you've ever heard of Giorgio Vasari. Wow, good, one. <laughs> Otherwise, I pretty much thought so. He was an unrivaled chronicler of the Renaissance. He wrote a book in 1568 called The Lives of the Painters, Sculptors, and Architects. In the 1560s, Vasari redecorated the council hall of the Palazzo, Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. What is important about that, and what is important about that room, is that less than 100 years earlier, in that same room, side by side on the same wall, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo Buonarroti were hired to paint vast battle scenes in direct competition with each other. Leonardo was in his early 50s and renowned throughout Europe when he was commissioned for this work in 1503. He had just painted the Mona Lisa and was incredibly famous even in his own day. And so he was commissioned to paint a vast rendering of the 15th century Battle of Anghiari. Then in December of 1504, a year later almost, a far younger Florentine was commissioned to paint the 14th century Battle of Caschina on the same wall of the council hall. There's going to be a test later. <laughs> Michelangelo was just 29 and a prodigy. By age 23, he had already carved the Pietà in St. Peter's in Rome. In May 1504, the same month that Leonardo was working on the battle painting, Michelangelo's statue of the David which, by the way, if you don't know, is a political statement about the rise of the Republic. That vast colossus was installed outside the Palazzo Vecchio, same building where this room was. Michelangelo's presence outside as you come in every day. Vasari the Chronicler says that Michelangelo was commissioned in competition with Leonardo. Wouldn't you love to be in that room? With competition came paranoia and eventually hatred. Michelangelo had little time for Leonardo. According to Vasari, he made his dislike so clear that Leonardo left for France to avoid him. For his part, Leonardo made snarky comments in his notebooks on the wooden qualities of Michelangelo's painting. I would love to have been in the room. Who is the greatest? Life is competition, isn't it? Even among those who have no need to compete. I mean, Leonardo and Michelangelo in the same room. Both gifted, both famous, both sought after, both assured of being legends in their own time and beyond, both ending up hating each other. Seems like a waste. Really silly, doesn't it? So that brings us to Jesus' disciples arguing along the way about who is the greatest. They're all with Jesus. They've all participated in healings and miraculous events. They've all had a chance to hear him teach. Who needs more than that? Yet there they are in our scripture today having gotten busted because they were arguing about which of them was greater. How much of our trouble in this world, how much of the trouble in our lives comes from the idea that we need to be better than somebody else? That we are, in fact, better than someone else, anybody else, everyone else. Better than is played out daily in our lives. In tweets, what are they called now that Twitter's not Twitter? <laughs> Xs? Yeah. 
They're played out on every social medium, in the news, in politics, in government, in our relationships. Better than is played out in corporate greed and selective humanitarian efforts. Better than is played out in privileged politicians and discounted women. Better than is played out in the sins of racism and sexism and elitism. And somehow, we've come to expect it. And somehow, it seems to pass as acceptable. And closer than that, closer to home, better than is played out in all the ways that we try to exercise superiority over each other in our relationships, in our workplaces, and in our church even. Better than is played out in the, the humble bragging you see on social media. You know what I mean when I say humble bragging? It means I've got a camera and I'm filming myself being good to someone. Rule of thumb, if you're gonna help someone, don't take a camera. Better than is played out in the way we pat ourselves on the back for not clobbering that particularly annoying relative at Thanksgiving dinner. Better than is played out whenever we act as if we are worth more because we love or are loved more, or we suffer more, or we carry more, or we earn more, or we help more. Better than is played out when we use us and them to describe people. And Jesus asks, why? And I am convinced that God weeps over it because every time we do it, we betray the persons God wants us to be. Jesus talked to a lot of riv uh, rich and privileged people. I almost made that one word, privileged. Rich and privileged people, people in power, about the last being first and the first being last. <clears throat> he doesn't just do it in one place, in one scripture. Jesus taught his bickering disciples that losing the life you want is more important than keeping it at the expense of others. I have to think that he meant all of it. And he meant for all of us to pay attention. And to prove he meant it over and over again, Jesus moved among the least of. Now you know what that weird sentence in the call to worship was about, or the confession. Blessed are the least of these, he said. He moved about inside and beyond the territory of his own people, touching the hopeless and restoring the lifeless and embracing the outcast. He purposely ate with people nobody else would invite to the table. He purposely empowered people who had been tossed aside. He purposely pointed out where the religious people and the power people were getting it wrong. He proved by his actions over and over and over again that there is no room for better than in the realm of God. <clears throat> so I wonder when we lost that sense. And when will we feel I really realize that we did? Have we realized it yet that we've lost that? And I think the text asks, asks us, what are we going to do about it? It gives us this example and says, where are you in this? Where are you when it comes to following Jesus? Faith is about that. The kingdom of God is about that. We forget that so often. We treat the life and the grace that God offers to us like, well, like pie. <laughs> if I get a slice, and I will because I am better than you after all, that is one less slice for you, right? 
Friends, the realm of God is not pie. God's grace and love and favor are not pie. My getting some does not mean that you do not. There are no better people in God's realm than me. Such good news. But there aren't any people who are less better than me. That's not how it works. There's no hierarchy. There's no winners. There's no competition. For those who compete and those who keep score and those who need someone to lose in order to feel like they've won, this is bad news. For the rest of us, it's pretty good news indeed. And for those in the faith community, the church, the news about justice and equity, the call to justice and equity is something expressed best in community when we all participate. I think this is the other issue Jesus is having with his disciples arguing on the road to Capernaum. They're acting as if they're the only ones Jesus is concerned with. They're arguing amongst themselves which of themselves is the greatest because clearly only the 12 of them count. And so Jesus pulls a child into the conversation and says, no, it is not about you. It's the least of all that I'm concerned with. It is your job to level the field. And he knows they can only do it together. The bickering, the counting, the comparing is meaningless and absolutely counter to his purpose. The gift of being the 12 together is that they have the platform and the conviction and the resources to change the world. Together they can do what none of them can do alone and Jesus is calling them them to change the world, to turn it right side up. That's the model for the church. That's practical Christianity. So what happened with the paintings by the competing legends on the wall of the council hall of the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence? Leonardo actually got a lot further than Michelangelo. He took a long time to finish his cartoon. You know, the cartoon is the the sketch, the blueprint of what a painting is going to look like. He made a unique machine, a wooden elevator, so he could move up and down the wall to paint. Michelangelo never got past the drawing stage, but what a drawing. He took over uh, a room in the Hospital of the Dyers in Florence and drew a full-size cartoon in superb detail. He never got to paint on the wall in the council hall. Leonardo did, though he used a paint formulation he copied from Pliny, which discolored and partially disintegrated very shortly afterwards. And then in 1565, 60 years later, Giorgio Vasari, the author who chronicled the competition, painted over what survived of the most ambitious public art commission of the Renaissance, obliterating every trace of one of the most extraordinary projects in Renaissance art. It's a shame, really. May God help us hear what God wants us to hear. Amen.